So I want you to join me in the book of Romans, if you will, this evening, the book of Romans, chapter 8. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit more reading than I normally do. And uh, we should have all of our technology up and running by the next time you're here. So thank you for your patience. And uh, But the book of Romans, chapter 8 and verse 24. The Bible says, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that, we see not, then we then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. There are times that we don't even know how to pray. Amen. Amen. I, I know my audience tonight, and so I know that there are many times there's people in this place right now that have really not known what to say when we knelt in prayer. But the Scripture says, but... The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For in whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them, he also called. And whom he called them, he also justified. And whom he justified them, he also glorified. And then finally, verse 31. For what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I realize we could just rush right to verse 31 and say if God be for us, then who could be against us? But to see something in context, Paul says, so what shall we say? How can we conclude this matter? He said, here's how we can put a period on this sentence. If God be for us, then who can be against us? Amen. With the help of the Lord and with your participation, I want to... I want to preach to you this evening from this thought, when the spirit groans, when the spirit groans, amen. You can be seated and God bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you to our praise team and our singers and musicians tonight. God bless you. Several years ago, and uh, could have been maybe a couple of decades by now, but it was not uncommon to see bumper stickers or maybe tags on a vehicle that just simply stated Jesus cares. Jesus cares. It was a very simple but profoundly powerful statement. Jesus cares. To know that someone cares and truly cares is a tremendous treasure. It's a value to realize that in, the, in a broken moment or uncertain moment of your life that, that somebody comes alongside you and you feel their compassion and you feel their heartbeat and that they understand that they care. You can see in their eyes. Maybe they, their vocabulary has fallen short and perhaps there's not words to say. Or maybe they're trying to say something but it's not coming out right. But it's, it's that gleam in their eye that assures you that they care. And so when we think about Jesus being that person that cares, knowing everything that is going on around us, the things that are in our family that we're dealing with or things in the church that you deal with, things in our community, in our state, in our nation, around the world as it has already been mentioned, to know that in the midst of all of that chaos that Jesus cares, he cares. That brings me great consolation to know that if no one else cares, Jesus cares. Amen. I don't want really anybody to raise your hand and certainly I'm going to ask you not to get up and run the aisles, but um, I'm sure that we've all thought at times that no one cared. <laughs> and uh, nobody knows and nobody cares and if anybody did know, they wouldn't care. And, and it's not that we were weak and fragile and made of porcelain, but it's just that we had reached that breaking point in our mind and our heart and we felt like from the responses of others around us or the lack thereof that, 
that, that nobody cared, but to know that when I kneel in prayer, that really Jesus does care. He is concerned about where I am, my station of life, your station of life, wherever that is, whatever that may be. And so when we look in, in our lives, when we look back and we see things that we've gone through or maybe see where we've been or perhaps you maybe see where you are right now or how people have treated you in the past or sadly maybe how someone's treating you right now, we have to remember in the midst of all of that cloud and confusion that Jesus truly cares. There's comfort in his word. There is comfort and consolation in his word. There are multiple moments in scripture where we find Jesus at a literal intersection of life and death. And we find many moments in scripture where Jesus was standing at that resurrection moment. In Luke chapter seven and Luke chapter eight, uh, we can find such instances of, uh, of Jairus' daughter. Jesus tells us that, that in this instant, or in this instance rather, that Jesus had to ask some that were in the room to leave. And then he speaks a, a, a word to this young girl and tells her to arise. The Bible tells us that she arose. And I, I find it interesting that Jesus had to ask some to leave the building or some to leave the room at least. I heard one preacher refer to this. He said, you gotta, you gotta remove the blessing blockers out of your life. <laughs> Amen. And sometimes we've got, we've got blessing blockers in our life. We gotta get those distractions out and move them out of the way so that the blessings of God could flow into that particular situation. Now, the Bible is very specific about a lot of things, and certainly it is vague in other areas, and this is one of those areas. We don't know what happened to cause the Lord to say to this group of people, I'm going to, ask to ask you, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I'm not thinking that it was just a brawl, but there must have been some measure of unbelief that needed to be removed from the room. It needed to be removed from the situation so that God could be at work. And so I pray, and, and I'm gonna continue to pray that God will move the blessing blockers out of my life. And, and even if it's a part of my own heart and unbelief, move that block, amen, and let the spirit of God flow and let it flow, flow freely. Then there is the story of Jesus standing at the tomb of Lazarus. And Lazarus was in the tomb four days. And again, I know that you know this story. And when Jesus got there, his sisters, Mary and Martha, both of them very dedicated to the cause of, and, and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. But in their humanity, they said, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. But in reality, I'm gonna say something we've heard many, many times over, that Jesus was not late he was not late then and he's not late ever. Jesus is always on time. I remember many years ago again, another minister was talking about this story or something similar and he said, you know, uh, I, I know that the Lord is never late and that he's always on time, but it sure would be cool if you'd show up early every now and then. Really be cool if you'd do that. But he's always in that right moment and it's always with the right thing and the right word he was late only according to their calculations. It was just their calendar and it was just their clock. But God knew exactly what was going on. I know sometimes it seems like the Lord has forgotten situations or circumstances. And again, I don't want to belabor the issue, but I understand that I'm also teaching to people tonight that have prayed about things for many years before it came to fruition in your life. It wasn't just one day and one Sunday and the Spirit of God moved. We've had those moments as well where we came to church with a problem and before we got home, it was all ironed out. I mean, it was all taken care of. It was a sealed deal. But we, many of us, have, we have walked into the house of God with a problem and we've gone home to that problem. Amen, I was being careful not to say you went home with that problem. <laughs> Maybe you did. Maybe they were in the cab of the truck with you. Who knows? I don't know. But, but we went there. We went back to that problem, and it was still there, and we prayed about it again and again and again. 
And so something like that can, there can be discouraging moments. There can be moments and seasons, uh, or at least times in those seasons where we wonder, does the Lord really care about the outcome? Does he really care about me in all of this? Because beneath the midst of all this mess, there's a person. There's a heart that's beating with warm blood that has feelings and emotions and it has needs and desires that are all well within the realm of human reasoning. And so does God truly care? It may seem like that Jesus has left us right in the middle of the mess, but the Bible tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So even in those moments when I feel left, and those moments when I feel forsaken, I've got to go to the word of God and just stand on the promise that if this is right, then this is right. If one part of the Bible is right, then the whole loaf is right. And so I've got to stand on that word and say, you said you would never leave me and that you would never forsake me. Amen. And he may not show up when you want him to. That's the, that is the truth. That's more than just the line in a song. He may not show up when you want him to, but he'll be there right on time because he's an on time God. Amen. That's what happened in, in, in Luke chapter seven. The Bible says that it came to pass the day after that he went to a city called Nain. Now Jesus had just left Capernaum and in Capernaum he had healed a centurion's servant. And so on the day after, Jesus is traveling and his ministry is moving forward. I think it's interesting that in in the life of the Lord we can always see more than just signs, miracles, and wonders. There's also patterns that we can see. Certainly we can highlight easily the signs, the miracles, and the wonders, and we can rejoice about those. It's a little bit more obscure often to see the pattern of the Lord. But I'd like to pause here tonight to tell you that the pattern of the Lord was this, that on this day he is in name and he is about to do something. But the, the, the day before, he was in Capernaum. And when he was in Capernaum, he was doing something in a centurion's life. And so the, 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 the bottom line is this, is that when you find the Lord, he's always working. Amen, he's always working. He's always working. And so I believe that in like fashion, we should understand that, that I know in our calendar, Sundays and Wednesdays are moments that we highlight. But that's not the only days we should show up for work. Amen, we should always be working. He didn't just call us to show up today or show up tonight. He didn't just call us to show up every now and then, but he called us to be workers, workers in the body of Christ. <clears throat> One of the many things that I can appreciate about the Lord is that no matter where I am, or no matter where we may be, the Lord doesn't mind meeting us there. There won't be enough blood on the floor of an emergency room for him to stand on the outside and say, you get that cleaned up and I'll come in. There won't be enough mess anywhere at any time. I remember Brother Mike Williams many years ago talking about the story of Lazarus. He preached a message entitled, The Stink Won't Stop Him. <laughs> Amen. The stink won't stop the Lord. You can't intimidate him. You can't keep him out. He's not afraid to get dirt under his nails, so to speak. He's not afraid to get dust on the, on the borders of his garment. Amen, he is with us. He doesn't mind meeting us where we're, wherever we are. And so whatever location we're in, the Lord will show up. I found myself in a place and in places where it seemed as though people, or at least some people, had forgotten all about me. And, and, and in that moment, I could be reminded that the Lord hadn't forgot about me. Now, it's entirely possible for people to forget about you. One of the great concerns that inmates encounter when they are going to prison is the fact that they are often forgotten. I'm, I want to share this statistically with you. It is a fact that, that uh, there are statistics that draw out timelines for inmates, especially those that are serving a lot of time, and how that each year more and more people in their friends, their realm of influence, and even in their family, and how as the time goes on that that line begins to decline further and further and further. And often once an inmate loses their entire immediate family, they have lost almost everyone. 
and they have become just a number. No one to communicate, no one to write, no one to pray for them. It's sad to think about that, but it's true. Life pushes us on in a different direction and we just move on. Maybe it's not a calculated move. I'm not here to address that particular thing, but what I'm saying is that it is, imp- it is entirely possible for people, for humanity, to forget about you, to move on. But God doesn't forget about us and he knows exactly where we are. I mean, we serve a God that's never gonna lose our address. He's never not gonna recognize our voice. And so, in this text, Jesus goes to this city called Nain. And the Bible says that his disciples were going with him. His disciples, those were those that were connected to him. Those associated to him. Those who recognized him. They were up close and personal it was a hands-on thing with them. They were, they were not just connected physically to the ministry of Jesus Christ, but they were connected to the heartbeat of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And they were concerned about what they were doing. But then the Bible says that there was another crowd. The Bible says that the disciples went with him, and then the scripture just says, and much people, and much people. And so let me just stop here and tell you that there will always be this uh, propensity for there to be much people. There's always a propensity for spectators to be around. I mean, you just let a fire engine go by or an ambulance or, or something and many times, and I've been guilty myself of just following them to the scene of the accident because it's easy to be a spectator. There are those that just wanna watch and see what's going on in the church or what's going on around. And so in church, the church is not immune to this. We have the same thing that can happen. And those that want to do something and those that are involved, thankfully we have those. And then we want to, we have others that just want to sit and watch others do things. I mean, that's just how life goes. And uh, that's, that's in every capacity of life. But really and truly, <clears throat> we don't have time for spectators. Amen. We don't have time to be spectators is what I'm trying to say. We don't have time. The time is too near drawn for us to sit on the sideline and just watch others carry on. But I'll tell you what happens when people become just spectators. They start many times just finding fault with things that are going on around them. This can happen in church. It can happen on your job. It can happen in your family. The list goes on and on. This past, <clears throat> this past April, Sister Thetis Tinney was in Ocala and she was one of our speakers for our ladies' conference. And um, Brother Justin Rogers told me this later that she was admiring our campground and the facilities and was complimenting all of those that keep everything up. And uh, she is from Louisiana and her husband, she and her husband, uh, her husband was a long, long time serving district superintendent of the state of Louisiana. So they have a large campground in Tioga and so she knows all about campgrounds. And so she told Brother Rogers while she was here visiting at ladies' conference, she said, oh, I just love campgrounds. She said, I just love campgrounds. She said, but I like to walk around campgrounds, but I don't like to look around campgrounds. Because she says, when you look around campgrounds, you start seeing everything that needs to be fixed. (laughs) And uh, so Brother Rogers was sharing this story with me when it happened. And then over the last several days, of course, we've been getting ready for the kickoff of a camp season. So we've been trying to get everything ready. He shared that story and he's reminding me over and over every day. He said, you need to stop looking. (laughs) You got to stop looking because Monday's here and and it's time to kick off and Monday's here. And I can attest that that is true. Uh, We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 56 toilets and 61 sinks and over 100 doors So something's always leaking, something's always running, something's always squeaking. And so sometimes you you just can't look because you'll never get anything done. You'll just see what's wrong and not see what's right. And so there's something about being engaged in something. It preoccupies you. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it's okay for something to leak or something to run or something to squeak, but It means that we're so engaged in this that I don't have time to see about that or 
take note of that. I want to engage myself. I want to make sure that I am walking where God wants me to walk. I don't want to be a spectator, and I don't think church is a spectator sport. I don't think it's someplace we go and this platform is the stage and we're entertainers and that I'm a lecturer and you're the student or, or that these are entertainers and you're just there to critique the, the note of the, of the song or the beat or, or, or none of the above. But we've come here, this is a God thing. Amen, this is a God thing. We've come here to worship and, and you know what? Sometimes we get it right. We really do get it right and sometimes we don't get it right. Sometimes the song is not what we thought it was going to be. It's not going to go over like we thought it was going to go over. And, and you know what we do? We just go outside and burn all the songbooks. We just chop up all the instruments. Sometimes I preach messages that didn't come out anywhere near live like it did in my office or in the house when I, where I was putting it together. There were multiple places in my notes where I had left myself a little notation, pause and give everybody time to settle back down and get back to their seat. But you see, that wasn't really a notation that was needed in the real world. I don't really do that, by the way. Amen, but... <laughs> But there are a few key moments when you're writing them down, you'll think this is gonna go really good, this is gonna go, and those things just drip over the edge of the pulpit. So you know what we do? We go and burn the pulpit and we, we burn all our Bibles and we say, I'm never gonna do that again. No, no, that's not what we do. We just say, you know what? We're gonna do this again. We're just gonna come back. We're gonna hit it harder. We're gonna be more firm. We're gonna plant our feet. We're gonna try it again. Just because it didn't work the other day doesn't mean it's not gonna work today. We're gonna try to do it again, amen, but if you want to be happy in your walk with God, I've got a really good recipe for you, get up and do something, amen, stop walking around, and looking, don't stop walking around, but stop looking around, amen, Sister Tini says, I love to walk around campgrounds, but I don't like to look around, and so I'm asking all the lookers to become walkers, amen, and say, Lord, help us to get involved, and help me to shoulder the load, and so when you come to church, don't let singers sing by themselves, join in with them and help them sing. Well, he said, well, I may not be a singer. I can't carry a tune in the bucket. That don't matter. I mean, you know where I'm going with this. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Don't lo let those that lead in prayer stand here and pray alone. Amen. Throw your voice into that choir of prayer. Amen. And say, oh God, touch us today and anoint us. Don't allow those that lead us in worship to lead alone. I'm going to say it again. I don't have any idea why anybody that has the Holy Ghost needs anyone to say we ought to praise him, we ought to magnify him. I do understand we do come to church tired we do come to church sometimes sick in our body, we do come time we do come in sometimes and we are belabored and we are just burdened down with things I get it, we're human and sometimes we need and I'm thankful that we have that but I say Lord, amen I don't want them to have to ask me more than one time. I, I, I may need somebody remind me every now remind me because I'm human not remind me because he is God but I want to get on board and I want to say Lord whatever I can do help me to get involved because I know there are moments in our lives when we are facing situations where we don't know how to pray and we don't know where to turn or what to do I haven't forgotten my text nor have I forgotten my title we're going somewhere tonight amen in verse 12, in verse 12 the Bible says that the that this man that had lost his life, he was dead, was carried out. And then the Bible says that of his mother that she was a widow. Now the Bible, again, this is one of those places where there's a lot of details that are missing. So the Bible doesn't tell us how long she has been a widow, doesn't tell us exactly the timeline of how all of this played out but I believe there is a very clear picture for us to consider. Here comes a widow woman. She has already lost her husband and now she has lost her son. Amen. So if we could just slow down if the camera for just a moment, if we could just hit the pause button for just a moment, we could clearly see that here is a woman that is dealing with some serious weight on her shoulders. There is a loneliness that cannot be described. The sheer weight of life was pressing in on her. And the Bible says in verse number 13, it says something very interesting that I want to pause and underline. The Bible says, and when he saw her, he had compassion on her. Amen. Now he 
knew all things before, during, and after. He knew about the loss of her husband and he knew about the loss of this son. But the Bible says when he saw her. Now she was not the centerpiece of this setting. She was not the centerpiece of what's going on. Amen. There was a funeral procession, if you please, but the Lord saw her. He didn't just see what was going on around her. He saw what was happening inside of her. He saw her heart. He saw her mind. He saw her broken spirit. Amen. There are people I would submit to you tonight that look like everything is okay in their life, but you have no idea what's going on in them. And I'm so thankful that the Lord doesn't just take a snapshot of our lives and say, well, everything must be well. But when he saw her, he had compassion on her because he saw her heart and he understood well. I want to tell you today that I understand that we are often almost victimized. That's a pretty strong word, but we're often almost victimized by social media today because people don't post their bad days. Well, most don't post their bad days. People post their high moments. Very, very few people sitting in line taking pictures of a crystal burger. But they probably gonna send you a picture of their plate from Ruth's Chris. I'm just saying. And so we're victimized sometimes because we look at that and we scroll through profiles and it looks like everything is just wonderful. Every day is a holiday and every meal is a banquet. And why can't you be more like her husband? And why can't you be more like his wife? And why did we have these children? (laughs) You can be seated. Amen. That's why it's so dangerous, even sinful to cast judgment on people or situations. You have no idea. You have no idea. You find your worst problem. You find your worst scenario. And if you find somebody who knows the whole story and they turn that around just a little bit, you may realize that what you think you're looking at that is so bad is probably one of the greatest miracles of all time. Amen. I'm so thankful that We have a savior that doesn't just look on the outside, but he looks at what's going on on the inside. Now, I think it's also interesting and and somewhat interesting at least that what Jesus tells this woman, he says, in this moment, we've still got our finger on the pause button now. Everything has stopped. And Jesus says, weep not. Now, that seems like a tall order for this moment, but that's what Jesus says, weep not. Now, this is not a cold and callous and indifferent Lord that is ignorant of the circumstances at hand, but there is some comforting truth to be found in this word, word, command. Weep not. Just a two-word command. Just dry it up. Amen. Sometimes we got to stop worrying over our situation and we've got to truly release this into the hands of God. Sometimes we say we have when we haven't. I'm gonna back that up. Sometimes I say I have when I really haven't. I really haven't left it at the altar. I really haven't left it in the hands of, I put it in the hands of God several times, but I've also gone back and taken it away. Amen, while we're sitting around trying to figure it out, God is already working it out. Now the Bible says in verse 14, and I just hope I can just send you home with just a little something to think about tonight. Amen, with the help of the Lord. But in verse number 14, the Bible says that Jesus steps into this scene and so we have this widowed woman, we have this what we would call in our, in our day, the Bible refers to it as a beer, but it would be what we would call a casket. And we have all of these mourners that are coming down and, and they're walking and Jesus steps on the scene and he says, weep not, weep not. And then the scripture says something very interesting and I hope that we can just capsulize this tonight. The scripture says that Jesus touches the beer or he touches the casket. And now watch what happens. The Bible says that they that bear him stood still. (laughs) 
I want you to picture this. They're moving forward, but Jesus stopped them. And then Jesus reaches out and he stops their pain from going any further, not another step. Amen. Sometimes we think the Lord needs to touch us. Touch me, Lord. I need you to touch me. But what we really need is for the Lord to touch the situation and touch the problem. The, the woman thought she could have really said, Lord, touch me. Touch me in my sorrow. Touch me in my pain. Touch me in my woe. Touch me in my loss. If she would have said, Lord, just touch me, she would have been robbed. The Lord knew what she needed to be touched. And he reached out and he touched the beer. Amen. And the Lord brought it all to a halt. halt. He didn't just stop the trouble. He spoke to the trouble. He didn't just stop there and scratch his head, ponder the situation, wondering where to from here. But he said, young man, he spoke to the problem. He said, young man, I say unto you, arise. He mean, I feel like tonight that the Lord would have us all to be reminded that God can speak not just to us, but God can speak to the situation that we're walking in. Hallelujah. If the Lord... It, the Lord could have comforted her in that moment and she could have still gone home alone but he said I'm going to touch the situation I'm going to touch the trouble I'm, I believe tonight the power of God the spirit can groan and make intercession for us amen if that woman if you had asked her what she needed she may have asked for the wrong thing and sometimes in our despair if we were to go to the altar and ask what we need we may be asking amiss we may be doing it sincerely it may be coming from the core of our heart but we may be doing it amiss hallelujah I say Lord I'm asking you to help us tonight amen I'm asking you to touch the trouble. I'm asking you to touch the situation. Amen. I'm asking you again. I mentioned it a moment ago. Daniel didn't need Daniel didn't need the Lord to just fill the stomach of the lions because their nature would have killed him whether they ate him or not. He said, Lord, I need you to lock their jaw. I need you to stop this situation. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you that God can touch sometimes. It's not us that needs the touch. It's the situation that needs a touch. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in what I'm saying here tonight. Amen. The Spirit of God in Mark chapter 4 found, I mean the Bible talks about in Mark chapter 4 where the disciples were in the boat and he was asleep on a pillow but the water and the waves were coming in. The life of, the loss of life was imminent. Amen. They didn't need the Lord to come to them one by one and pray for them to have peace. They needed the Lord to go and speak to the storm. Hallelujah. Because when we get give way to God, the spirit can groan. The spirit can groan. They may have said, Lord, give us peace or Lord, give us faith and they might have wound up swimming to shore but when they woke him and said, Lord, he knew what to do. Hallelujah. He didn't just touch the woman, he touched the casket. He didn't just touch the disciples, he spoke to the storm. He didn't, oh, hallelujah. He didn't just say to the man of Gadara in the next chapter, hey amen, everything's gonna be all right. We're gonna pray for you to get a job. We're gonna pray for you to get a home. Hey amen, when he walked up to Jesus, Jesus took the storm, hallelujah. He said, you gotta come out of him. And the Lord said, you're gonna go from here and you're gonna go into those swine and those swine are gonna go into the sea because the spirit knows what we need. I'm gonna tell you, hats men, apostolic church, I believe the Holy Ghost is speaking to our church tonight. Amen. We need to pray and say, Lord, we ask you to touch us. Amen. We ask you to touch the situation. We ask you, God, to move. You know what we need. The spirit, the spirit, the spirit, we need the spirit to groan. We need the spirit to groan. Verse 15, the Bible says that the young man sat up and was brought to his mother. After this great fear or reverence came upon those that were there and they began to glorify the Lord and they said, there's a prophet among us. They said, there's a great prophet that's risen up among us. You see, every time we see God's glory move in somebody's life, we ought to glorify the Lord. 
even if he's not moving in our situation, not moving in our life. And even if the pain hasn't lifted, the peril hasn't stopped. When we see God moving somewhere, it ought to assure us that God still moves. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to see more people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost here. I want to see more people be baptized in Jesus' name here. I want to see more people repenting here. But you know what? I'm not going to become so self-centered that when friends call me and talk about who got baptized and who got the Holy Ghost and who got healed and what miracle happened, I'm not going to fold my arms and I'm not gonna say well they must have compromised they must have done this no 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 I'm gonna weep I'm gonna rejoice with them you know why you know why because it assures me that God still moves and mankind still listens hallelujah 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 and so I say Lord we need the spirit to groan we need the spirit to groan I'll ask our musicians if you will to come amen tonight we We still have a savior that makes house calls. Oh, the woman at the well, she was mentioned not many services ago. When Jesus turned her situation around, the Bible says that that she ran back. (laughs) She ran back to tell all of her friends, come see a man who told me all things. Come and see a man. Amen. I believe that we all need to bring people back to the well. Tell them about a man who cares. Doesn't matter how bad your situation. I don't mean that in a cavalier way. I will say irrespective of how bad your situation may be. Amen. We need to be rest assured in our heart that Jesus still cares. And When you've been crying all night long, it's he that can wipe the tears from our eyes. Amen. There was a time when I didn't know how to care for myself. But I thank God he kept me when I didn't know how to keep myself. I believe that many here can testify that you've been through storms and you've been through rain and you've experienced heartache and pain. But what you found in the midst of all of that mess was the fact that you were serving a sustaining God that could help us when we couldn't help ourselves. Serving a God, you know, one writer said, we have not a high priest that can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we. We are serving a God that can feel and does feel what we feel. Amen, I'll ask you to stand. Perhaps in all of our lives, if we could have just a glimpse, transparent honesty, We've all said, well, our friends just don't understand. They've never been through what I've been through. That may be true. They've never stood where I'm standing and that may be true. And the most compassionate and the most understanding of the closest person in our life, we may have felt like they didn't get it. They didn't get it. But I want to read Romans 8 and 26 and 27 one more time before we walk out of this house. When they don't get it, when we don't get it, when they don't know what to say and when we don't know what to say, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I need the Spirit to groan. We need to let the Spirit groan. I would submit to you today that if I would go back to that Luke 7 illustration, if Jesus had just touched her, the end of the day may have been no different. But he touched the situation. 
And it all changed radically. They were, Brother Newburn marching that way. <laughs> but they turned around and went back home because the spirit groaned. He saw her and had compassion on her. He saw the brokenness of her heart and what caused that brokenness. Amen. I wonder tonight, right here in this moment, Amen. Would you just bow your heads with me in prayer and can we lift our voices together? Amen. Let's magnify the Lord in just this few moments we have left together. Let the Spirit of God touch us today in Jesus' name.